so I'm Raymond Walters, and I'll be talking a little bit about MTAG, and this is a, a slight topical shift from most of the presentations today, so we focus a little more on methods to try and push uh, our power for developing the risk scores as opposed to focusing on a particular application here, but we do have application in terms of depression and neuroticism. Uh, and so basically everything I'm talking about is also available in this manuscript on BioArchive, uh, and this also gives you the, the nice rundown of the many, many people who have contributed to this effort. Uh, specifically, I want to highlight Patrick, who you heard from earlier, who spearheaded this effort as well, but since <laughs> it's something else to talk about, I get to uh, have the privilege of telling you about MTAG. Um, so as Dan laid out this morning, uh, we're probably fairly familiar that at least for the highly polygenic traits, uh, the sample size demands for GWAS and by extension for uh, getting a good predictive accuracy out of uh, polygenic scores are fairly demanding. So uh, review papers have often focused on this in terms of sample size required to start getting genome-wide significant hits and how those scale in terms of needing tens or hundreds of thousands of individuals to start accruing. Uh, hits, and uh, by, by extension, not only do we need uh, want uh, hits in terms of having power to detect loci for risk scores, but we need a step further to try and drive down the amount of noise in our estimates of the actual effect sizes. So uh, arguably, the sample size demands for risk scores are uh, e even higher, and this has kind of been seen by the remaining gap even in these samples of hundreds of thousands of individuals, the remaining gap between the variance explained by uh, the polygenic scores versus the kind of theoretical maximum of uh, SNP heritability. Um, so there's still room to go. Um, and in that context of thinking about, you know, kind of the daunting task of accruing these large sample sizes, uh, we, we often note that, you know, that for whatever our trait of interest is, there's often existing GWASs of other traits that seem related. Uh, and in particular, um, kind of driven forward by this paper by Brendan Buick Sullivan and colleagues in 2015, giving us a method to look at genetic correlation between traits using LD score regression, um, have started to see that based on the GWAS results we have for a wide range of traits, um, we can kind of start looking at the, these, essentially a heat map of the correlation of the genetic components of these traits and do indeed see that there's large amounts of correlations here. And uh, as well on the, the right side here, looking at uh, more psychiatric, uh, neurological, and again, some of those kind of corresponding population covariates. But there's this amount of overlap here, and then there may be cases where, you know, your trait of interest may be at a sample size of a few tens of thousands, but there may be something closely related that has a much higher sample size just because it's easier to collect. So you can imagine, like, if you're interested in fasting glucose, you might do well to start looking at information that's available on BMI, just because there's a high correspondence of the genetic signal there. And so where, where this leads us is to not an entirely novel thought, um, but that given that there are these related GWASs of these phenotypes, and certainly a lot of effort has gone into collecting all those related samples, that uh, it'd be great if it could kind of borrow power from those genetically related traits to push forward the amount of information we have on our trait of interest. And in the context of MTAG, we're going to try and do this specifically in the case where we may have overlapping samples between those different GWASs and where we don't have access to the individual level data to do some sort of nicer joint analysis just because we know kind of the challenges of acquiring individual level uh, genotype data. And so I'm going to talk through the, the method that we've assembled, the MTAG method, to accomplish this task, and then talk about the kind of applied results uh, here in neuroticism and depression. So the model for MTAG is a relatively uh, simple construct. So if we say we have T different traits, uh, and we look at a given SNP, we have this vector of its true marginal effect size for each of those traits. So this is the vector beta for a single SNP J, um, but uh, of length T for whatever collection of traits you're interested in looking at. Uh, and we're going to say that across those traits, um, we have some sort of something that we can at least model as a random effect here with correlation across those traits indexed by this omega correlation matrix. So this is kind of the, the expectation here would be this is matrix is directly proportional to the genetic correlation matrix, but at the level of the amount of variation of effects of individual SNPs as opposed to the total genetic effect. And so if we take these effects and then look at what we have for our GWAS estimates, we get very fairly straightforwardly that we're going to have uh, those true effects plus some estimation error. 
And importantly, as I said, we want to handle the case where there's sample overlap. So we're not going to impose some diagonal constraint on this sigma matrix. We're instead going to say there could be sample overlap, there could be, and thus there can be um, kind of correlated estimation error across the samples. Um, so given this model for the effects, we can go through a derivation for uh, the maximum likelihood to get to uh, this estimator of the marginal effect uh, for a given SNP, so beta sub j, and sub t for a specific trait. Um, we can actually get there without the maximum likelihood assumptions and do a methods of moments and we arrive at the same estimator. I'm just going to talk about it in terms of maximum likelihood because that's simpler. Uh, and so the, the math here is in terms of uh, the, the, that vector of estimated effects, that beta sub j there on the far right, and this uh, omega matrix and the sigma matrix, and uh, in particular this extraction of elements out of the omega matrix into these vectors in lowercase omega. But rather than you know, diving through all of the ugliness of this equation, we'll just kind of work through the intuition. So if we start with those estimates of the beta from each of the respective GWASs, again, this is the vector for a single SNP across traits, and then we look at the covariance of each of those traits with our target trait. So that's the subscript T there. And so essentially, if you, you, are, you covary perfectly, you get the full GWAS estimate from the other trait. If it's only a partial covariance between the two traits, you get kind of that partial attenuated effect. And uh, this, this attenuation is kind of indexed related to the expected amount of variance for the trait you're targeting. So essentially, this is just scaling to the right levels for the heritability of that phenotype. And then given those pieces, we want to weight how we pool together across uh, the different phenotypes. And that gets managed by this component here. And so um, what's going on in, in this set of things is that we're essentially finding the residual variance that exists in these beta sub j's to use as weights, um, similar to what you'd expect for uh, inverse variance weighted meta-analysis. And in fact, uh, under specific constraints, this does directly reduce to a standard inverse variance weighted meta-analysis. We've just generalized to account for sample overlap and for imperfect genetic overlap between the traits. Um, so specifically, the pieces in here are the, this function of the, the full omega matrix and the extracted vectors that essentially says we're going to take the full amount of genetic variation uh, in the betas that exist kind of covariating across traits. Then we're going to remove the piece that's uh, related to our trait T that we're focused on estimating here. And what that leaves us is essentially the residual of genetic effects that aren't in trait T but are in the other traits that we're plugging into M tag. So that, that, that other genetic variance that is essentially noise and thus is added residual variance that we don't want to um, be used for giving uh, additional weight to the estimate. Uh, and taking that like, residual genetic effect, we add the standard um, uh, residual that's there from the estimation error. Uh, but again, allowing for the potential for the sample overlap in that matrix. Uh, so those are the pieces that go in the estimator. Um, we actually have to, you know, to actually accomplish the estimation, it's uh, somewhat stepwise. And so kind of the key starting point here is that we can actually directly estimate what that sigma matrix is, that, uh, that correlated estimation error that may incorporate sample overlap, may uh, reflect um, kind of similarity of uh, confounding effects. Uh, by using the intercept out of LD score regression. So it turns out that this quantity, the sigma matrix, is directly what drops out as the intercept term from doing LD score regressions for uh, the, the pairs of traits. And once we have that estimate, then uh, we can estimate the omega matrix to get the covariance of the genetic effects via maximum likelihood or via method of moments. And once we have those two pieces, those along with the, the GWAS betas go into the formula from the previous slide to get to our M tag estimate of the, the beta. Um, so that allows us to actually you know, have the proper values to plug into that formula. Uh, so that, that uh, finishes laying out what the, the method is. I'm going to skip simulation showing that the mechanically this works. They're in the manuscript. Uh, but instead, I want to now focus on how this is functioning in application. So I imagine most of you are familiar with ICU's paper from last year um, with the results on subjective well-being, depressive symptoms, and neuroticism. And we've essentially taken that same data and applied MTAG uh, to a slightly very a minor update to uh, look at the results here. 
And so uh, if we just kind of recap on what those cohorts are, it's fairly clear why we started at the outset with wanting to work with summary statistics and without individual level data. Uh, and we're interested in correlated traits. So on the, on the right hand side here, we have the kind of clear signal of genetic correlation amongst this trio of traits with the, the positive correlation between depressive symptoms and neuroticism and then the negative correlation against those with subjective well-being as might be intuitively anticipated. Um, and you know, very strong compelling amounts of uh, genetic overlap there. Um, but then when we look at the composition of the cohorts, we see this instance where you know, lots of data from 23andMe, where the chances of getting access to individual level data is virtually zero. And lots of overlap between the, the cohorts that are available for these phenotypes, in particular from having all three phenotypes in UK Biobank, where you know, if, if we wanted to reduce to just disjoint samples, we might be able to parse that out of UK Biobank. You know, if you ask 23andMe really nicely, maybe they could resolve any sample overlap that might exist in their cohorts. Debatable. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but given that these phenotypes have been measured for all these individuals, it makes sense to take advantage of having all that information rather than having to make some decision about, you know, which individual gets to count towards which of these related phenotypes. And after all, the goal is to make use of all the available information to advance power as much as possible. So this is particularly the kind of case where being able to include uh, overlapping uh, single trait GWASs um, is uh, highly beneficial. So essentially what we've done is we run mTAG with these three sets of phenotypes and then started thinking about if we compare those mTAG results to the single trait GWASs, um, what, what, what can we see about how mTAG is pushing forward our results? So we can start with kind of the simple counting of number significant loci, kind of traditional like how good is your GWAS, how does the Manhattan plot look? But it's probably a little more compelling to think in terms of effective sample size. So as an index of power that's a little less idiosyncratic to genetic architecture, you know, if we, how big a GWAS would we have to have of the individual trait to get to a power comparable to what we're seeing out of mTAG? And then most relevant to this audience, uh, how much are we able to improve prediction accuracy? So we'll go through each of these. Um, uh, as you might, might expect for something where we're claiming an improvement in power, we do see a, a nice gain in terms of number of individual loci passing that threshold for significance. So it's close to double here in depressive symptoms. So the Manhattan plot for the single trait GWAS is there on the left and the Manhattan plot for mTAG uh, pooling um, the results across all three phenotypes and then looking at the results for depressive symptoms is there on the right. Um, and we see even bigger gains for neuroticism, where we go from nine GWAS loci to 66 after applying MTAG, and similar for subjective well-being, where we go from 13 to 60 after applying MTAG. Um, but as I said, perhaps a, a, a little more useful, if slightly less intuitive, to think of this in terms of effective sample size. Uh, and so I'm, I'll try to avoid worrying about the math here too much, but essentially, under a very basic polygenic model, we can say that there should be a roughly linear relationship between sample size and the average chi-square statistic out of our GWAS. This is kind of what lives under the LD score model, lives on, which lives under the LD, uh, under the MTAG model, and is just as a rough approximation gives us a, a nice scaling. And so what this does then is if we take the average chi-square out of the GWAS in relation to the average chi-square out of mTAG, that's kind of this fraction there on the far right, uh, that gives us the hinge to look at um, you know, what, what is our effective sample size for mTAG. So what we'll call here is the GWAS equivalent n. How large a GWAS would we have to do of the single trait to get um, uh, power uh, that we're getting out of mTAG? And so if we run this calculation for the three phenotypes here, we see that mTAG is buying us a 30 to 40 percent increase in sample size for depressive symptoms and 80 or 90 percent increase in effective sample size for neuroticism and subjective well-being. And now none, none of these were small GWASs to begin with. Um, neuroticism was the smallest at 168,000. I, I wish I'd, all my smallest GWASs were 168,000. Uh, but even then, th these are rather substantial gains in terms of number of individuals. Um, so you can imagine that we're fairly enthusiastic about how much information you gain uh, by kind of this pooling with mTAG across phenotypes. And certainly this will be pr kind of proportional to the degree of genetic correlation and the degree of heritability in each of these and relative sample size, uh, but at least in, in this kind of application, um, definitely seeing the benefits. 
And so where does that get us in terms of prediction accuracy? So what, what's on the plot here is the incremental R squares, and we're comparing the light colored bars for each trait is the, uh, the um, R square for the risk score out of the uh, individual trait GWAS, and comparing to the darker colored bar that is the, the prediction from the, the betas out of M tag. And so in both of these cases, we're applying LDPRED to try and get as much as we can in terms of prediction. Um, and while it's not entirely evident from the confidence intervals here, the difference between these is significant based on bootstraps of the, the independent replication cohort for testing these. And so we see, see a nice gain there, as we'd expect from uh, the claim I just made about having a larger effective sample size. And in fact, we can go back and double check. So I, I made a claim of how much power are we gaining in terms of effective sample size. Um, are we actually, is that gain that I just showed you in predictive accuracy consistent with the claim we made about growth and effective sample size? And so this isn't uh, quite equivalent to the debt loyal formula, but it's the same general idea that you're looking at the relationship between uh, the SNP heritability as kind of your theoretical maximum for prediction, and then how that relates to uh, that heritability plus the amount of error variance that's left in the risk score. And kind of the, the reason this formula works as a hinge for us is because we're going to compare um, the GWAS prediction uh, uh, to and kind of forecast out if we have a corresponding reduction in the error variance, what's our expectation for M tag? And so that process uh, looks roughly like this. So given the R square from the GWAS and some estimate of the, the SNP heritability, in our case out of uh, LD score regression, we can then solve that top formula for that amount of error variance that exists. And via this, the same kind of hinge of the mean chi-square from the GWAS versus the mean chi-square from M tag, uh, we can make this prediction about how much smaller that error variance should be, plug that back in with our estimate of the SNP heritability to get our prediction of M tag's uh, 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 increase in our square. And so if we look at, so I've taken the, the pairs of bars that are on the previous plot, and now this is just the difference between them with the confidence interval for the difference. Um, and compare those to the, the, the red dots here that are the formula I just described for the predicted improvement. And we can see that um, we're, we're definitely, at least in the ballpark of where we'd expect theoretically based on the numbers I just quoted you in terms of uh, effective sample size type scaling. We're perhaps slightly on the low end. Um, there's room here for some of the things Megan talked about in terms of differences in heritability and differences between features and cohorts, um, where certainly there may be some differences in terms of your uh, prediction cohort versus your discovery cohort, where you might expect to undershoot a little bit versus kind of a theorem the theoretical optimum here. Um, but we're at least very much in the, the ballpark of the gains we'd expect um, relative to the kinds of gains you'd get just from increasing sample size uh, to the kind of effective sample size that we've been talking about. Uh, so to wrap up, we have this uh, method called MTAG that we're very excited about that lets us do this pooling of GWAS of correlated traits from summary statistics with potential overlap between the individual GWASs to push towards better estimates of the SNP level betas um, for whichever those traits is your trait of interest. And we have, as I've just shown, can both discover more loci and improve uh, the accuracy of polygenic prediction, uh, as shown here in the application for depression, neuroticism, subjective well-being. I just want to conclude with kind of a, uh, a plug for the, as of this week, the code for this is now all publicly available on GitHub. I mean, it's put a lot of effort into getting this ready for uh, kind of more, more general use, and we're excited to see uh, um, ideas and new applications for MTAG to other phenotypes. Uh, so I'll leave it there.